I'd like to dedicate such merit as this uh, lecture may possess to the memory of the great Thomas Paine, the bicentennial of whose death will fall on the 8th of this month, next week. Um, Thomas Paine, as well as having uh, originated the American Revolution and tried to make it more radical by calling for the abolition of slavery, also played a good part in the French Revolution and tried to make it less absolutist by opposing, for example, the, the application of capital punishment to members of the former regime and said rather beautifully that to have had a part in two revolutions was to have lived to some purpose. He also is the originator, at least in, in the popular mind, of biblical uh, criticism. His Age of Reason was the first attempt to bring within the purview of those who were just learning to read the newly, the newly literate, the artisan class, the idea that the one book that they all knew, the holy text, uh, might not be holy writ um, after all. Um, I was Xeroxing a couple of pages of Deuteronomy yesterday in my hotel, looking exactly as I look now. And uh, of, of course, as you start to do that, it runs out of paper and malfunctions, so I had to summon one of the very nice clerks at the hotel who said, as he laid the Holy Bible flat and ran off some Deuteronomy for me and some Leviticus, what are you, um, are you preparing a sermon? <laughs> and I said to myself and to him, I cannot tell a lie, and I said, Yup, and then because I can't tell a lie, I said, you might say that. <laughs> now, a word of preparation. Um, Gore Vidal was once sitting with Sir Noel Coward and said to him, as one massive old darling to another, he said, have, have you never, are you telling me you've absolutely never, ever, ever had any sexual contact at all of any kind with any woman? And Noel Coward said, certainly not. And Gore said, you mean not even with Gertrude Lawrence? And Noel Card said, P particularly not with Miss Lawrence. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm a critic of all religions and of all faiths, but the one with which I p particularly don't agree is the one in which I was raised, and the one which I loved, um, love still. That's to say the Anglican Communion, um, the Cranmer Prayer Book, the English Hymnal, um, and the King James Bible. So when I make any references in direct quotation or speech, <clears throat> it'll be to that and not some terrible good news text from heaven knows uh, where. <laughs> okay. Um, those of you who have that tradition in common, by the way, uh, with me, will remember, I hope, um, Arthur Hugh Clough and Say Not the Struggle, Naught Availeth. You remember his... Um, his Decalogue, uh, it's, he, it's a very fine piece of mid-Victorian work. Um, adultery do not commit, advantage rarely comes of it. Um, <laughs> thou shalt not kill, uh, but um, needs not strive, officiously to keep alive. Um, the, the, so it goes on. There are, there's almost a Swiftian thing. Given that it's written by the man who wrote Say Not the Struggle, Nor Avail, I think it's rather um, impressive. Um, but, I mentioned it before I move on to my own rereading and recasting of the Ten Commandments. And I want briefly just to say why it is the subject is such a compelling and such an essential one. Um, all the great questions that divide theology from philosophy are finally, I think, reducible to two questions. Um, first, is it true, as is definitively stated in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, that at one time, one God created man or mankind in his own image? Or is it rather the case that many men at several times and in many places created many, many gods and continue to create many gods in their own images? As you'll see, a lot more hangs on that than just the very important shift from the singular to the plural. Second question is this. Is our sense of right and wrong, our knowledge of right and wrong, if you prefer good and evil? Uh, is it proper to ourselves? Is it innate to us? Is it our pride, our, our property? Or does it come to us as a gift uh, from revelation? Is it, it, is it part of a covenant with a supernatural authority? So you're pleased to bear in mind as I, as I go on that those two central questions underlie every word of this text and every examination of it. 
Now, it's not as easy as many people, including Clough, may have thought to isolate and identify Ten Commandments and then just do your own version of the Decalogue. Uh, to begin with, uh, the commandments appear three times at least in the Old Testament. And they are, in their several and discrepant appearances, they're embedded in great slabs of prose, which also mainly consist of orders, commands, other forms of edict or UKs, often very minutely spelled out and very highly uh, codified and specified. For example, not to get too far ahead of myself, the first iteration of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 is almost immediately followed by an obsessively detailed spelling out of the codes governing ox goring, a code which incorporates the famous equivalences of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, depending famously on whose ox is being gored, and which, just as the goring is starting to get boring, perhaps even boring to its almighty author, swerves off very abruptly at a complete tangent and says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, which also has the force of divine law, and all of it has the status of commandment, and all of it was used by Christians as such, and Jews, as a direct mandate until the incineration of the last witch. Um, a process that's still going on in some parts of the world, most notably in Africa, uh, and an event in our history that we have good and sad reason to know is still quite distressingly recent. So it's quite difficult to know where the 10, the Decalogue of Commandments, leaves off and the other instructions, UKs and edicts, so to say, kick in. Anyway, the first and the best known version, the one, ever, the one we think we're talking about, or you thought we were going to be talking about until you got here, appears in Exodus chapter 20. There's then a sulfurous interlude in which Moses, or after which Moses, smashes the original tablets, smashes the tablets inscribed by the finger of God. After that, there's a reprise of the commandments in Exodus 34, but by no means an identical one. And then after many wanderings and many sufferings on the part of Moses and his followers, the entire business, the whole Decalogue, is again redone and restated in Deuteronomy chapter 5. A lot of people are surprised to hear this. They shouldn't be. Um, the Pentateuch or the Torah has, within its five books, two different accounts of the creation story, uh, two separate genealogies of the seed of Adam, and two discrepant complete discrepant stories of Noah's flood. Uh, bear this in mind because we're coming back to it. So without forgetting these impending revisions that are coming to us, let's take the original version of the commandments anyway in their due order, see where they lead us. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that the business takes 16 verses, not 10. And the first injunction has very little to do with morality, if anything, and a lot to do with the amor prop of the lawgiver himself. And nor is it self-evident that the various declensions of this throat clearing of the first commandment are the same. No graven images are to be made of any living thing on heaven or earth or in the water. Is that one commandment? Possibly. No prostrations are to be made before any such image, which is not quite the same, is it, as the prohibition upon their manufacture. And the punishment here, which isn't cited for any other of the transgressions, is specified, <coughs> is that the fourth generation of the offender's children will be penalized for his sins. Um, some might say that the idea of punishing successor generations is a repulsive one, or at least not necessarily a moral one. It's more a frightening one than a moral injunction. And therefore, it's not a surprise to find stipulated by the Lord that he's a jealous God, as the King James Version has it, the authorized version, and will not allow other deities to be put on equal footing with him. Again, a little depends here on which translation one's employing. But it's permissible to speculate that Yahweh knows that there are other gods, or at least suspects that there may be other gods, and resents them, or anyone turning their affections in that direction. Uh, in other words, it's odd that this should be considered the foundational document of monotheism, since there appears to be someone who is uneasily, not to say uncomfortably, aware of the polytheistic possibilities of reality. After all, it's not so surprising again, I'm, I address myself here to people who like to rest their case on miracles. In Egypt itself, earlier, the pharaonic priests had agreed to a duel with Aaron about miracles, which both of them could produce. So that the 
ability to produce a miracle testifies to the validity of no particular faith. Um, they could, their, their conjury could produce great wonders also. So what we appear to be looking at is an angry competition for monopoly affection among an oligopoly of potential deities, somewhat more like the cruelty and caprice of Olympus. And the story is told by the already terrified fans of the apparent winner. So you, if you like, you can call of all of that one commandment, but it seems to me to be multiple ones and multiple injunctions. You are still, with the, with the jealousy and with the vanity and the caprice, you still have a separate commandment on not taking the Lord's name in vain. And once again, it's all backed up with the specific threat that offenses will not be soon forgiven. In fact, let me quickly, if I can find it quickly, not waste the time of that very nice Xerox operator, actually read it to you as it occurs in the King James Version. Both of these multiple commandments. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So you might think that someone who keeps the commandments won't have their children persecuted um, unto the next generation, so that if, if the next generation of children didn't keep the commandments, they'd still be protected by the fact that their parents had kept the commandments. But no, no. Um, thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord in, uh, the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Right. You see where I'm going with that. Um, all of this suggesting a great insecurity and unease. Then comes the requirement, again tediously repeated, for the observance of the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, I may as well finish this, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Um, uncontroversial in itself, a day off, but again, having nothing to do in this case with ethics or morality, but only with the fear of the Lord. It is only obedience to that fear that is moral. And it's interesting as marking, not for the first time uh, or the last, those to whom it applies. Male bosses and employers are the ones addressed. And their manservants and maidservants, nor their cattle, are permitted to work on Sunday or the Shabbat. A confusion between people and chattel, that is going to recur again very soon. Indeed, if anything, can show you that there's a, a good argument that the commandments are man-made and not God-ordained, it would be the general exodus emphasis on agriculture and sheep and lamb and goat products in general. I had a debate on the BBC recently with the, uh, Canon Slee, uh, one of the deputies of the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, in which I said that one of the things I, I disliked about Christianity when I was quite small was having to think of myself as a member of a flock in other words, as a sheep or lamb. Um, and also to having to reflect that shepherds don't look after sheep just because they like them, though some shepherds like them much too much. <laughs> but in order that they can first fleece them and then kill them. Um, and Slee, to his credit, he took me up on it rather decently. He said, you know, it was a problem for us with, with the church in New Guinea where I served for a considerable time because as with a huge number of areas of the world, there are no sheep in New Guinea. Exodus is limited in that way too. Even the animals it describes aren't available everywhere. So he said, we had to work out what the locals in New Guinea valued as the Israelites would have valued sheep. He said, it got to the point where one Easter, I saw my bishop get up into the pulpit and address his congregation and say in English to them, O oh Lord, behold, these your swine. <laughs> so you see where how off the track you can get, off the beaten track you can get with agricultural uh, metaphors and how confining... They can be, and of course it would have to be a pig, the very one that Yahweh most eloquently condemns elsewhere. As I say, if this is God-made, it looks somewhat man-made all the same. Now, furthermore, if one day and only one day is holy, it can suggest that others are profane. And that's led to a good deal of fetishism of the, of the Sabbath and of Shabbat. I remember when I used to work in Northern Ireland, 
tried to point out to the Reverend Ian Paisley, I worked for a Sunday show at the time. He wouldn't be interviewed by anyone whose show or newspaper came out on Sunday. So I tried to point out to him, Reverend, the, it's the Monday papers that are printed on the Sunday. <laughs> and I could see his piggy eyes sort of narrowing as he took this in. Um, it took him a long, long time before he'd given an interview to the observer. Um, but if, in the end, um, reason prevailed. So why not just say that the worker deserves one day off in seven? Why say that it's necessary only because the Lord, who effortlessly made heaven and earth in six days, doing what came naturally, rested on the seventh? Anyway, make a note of this stipulation, small though it may seem, because it's coming back. It's crucially varied in the Deuteronomy version. All right, moving right along. The next five commandments are famously brisk and terse, with the slight exception of the order to honor one's parents, because that comes not with the threat of punishment, but with an inducement this time. Obey it and... Thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So once again, one's forced to notice, these rules are not being urged for their own sake or because they are innately and self-evidently moral. They're being urged either to avoid the punishment of four, generation of one, four generations of one's children or in order to be given land that until now had belonged to Canaanites and other lesser breeds. They come to us, in other words, not as precepts of morality, but, the, but as accompanied and bodyguarded by a mixture of threats and promises. And it's interesting to notice that parents are nowhere told that they must be good to their children. But there may be a good reason for that too, and I'm coming back to that also. You'll forgive this fan dance of mine, promising you things down the road. If you don't shuffle too much. Okay, then the celebrated commandments against murder, adultery, theft, and perjury follow without any adornment, um, or with any bribe or threat. James Version famously says, thou shalt not kill, though the original Hebrew makes it very obvious that the meaning is, thou shalt do no murder. These transliterations, by the way, can be very hazardous and very useful. The Hebrew word alma, for example, uh, means young woman. That's all it means. When mistranslated by King James's committee as virgin, it very much alters the idea that a young woman will one day conceive and bring forth a son. And a great deal of misunderstanding has resulted from that error in translation. I'm, re I'm reminded of the lady governor of Texas, who during a controversy about bilingualism in the state house in Austin said, if English was good enough for Jesus Christ, it was plenty good enough for her. <laughs> uh, we so far haven't found any, any society in which the penal code, we've looked, anthropologists have searched, we've found no society in which the penal code approves of or is neutral about murder, <coughs> or theft, or perjury. Adultery is, is treated differently in different cultures, but the murder, theft, and perjury are not. Um, one might argue that the Jewish people wouldn't have made it as far as they did to Mount Sinai, assuming always that they did make the trip, if they had been under the impression that murder, theft, perjury, and adultery were okay until they uh, got there. The Analects of Confucius uh, mention the golden rule, or they have a version of it. They say, don't do to another person what would be repulsive to you if done to yourself. Um, the Babylonian rabbi Hillel more or less states the same thing when asked if you can summarize the whole of the Torah while standing on one foot. He says, yes, I can. Don't do to another what would be repellent if done to you. All else, there is the, the law, all else is commentary. Um, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which was already mentioned, which you can go see, um, Moses, I might just add to the excellent gloss that William put on it, um, Moses was supposed to have been, according to the story, a prince in Egypt. He would have had to know Egyptian law if he was a real person and if the story has any factual base. He would have had to know what someone would have had to testify in the Book of the Dead that they had not done or indeed had done. He would have had to know the quite sophisticated Egyptian court system of which we have reasonably good records. Um, at least a thousand years before Exodus was written down, that's to say, at least a thousand years before 1400 BC, Hammurabi promulgates a code of law in Babylon, not far away, that becomes pretty celebrated, particularly for its emphasis on the lex talionis, so-called. In other words, the concept of direct symbolic retribution, eye for an eye, uh, tooth for a tooth. So even if we had any reason to believe that the story of the enslavement in Egypt was true, or the wandering in the desert was true, or the conquest of the promised land was true, or that there was ever such a place 
as Mount Sinai, and Israeli archaeologists have made it increasingly impossible to regard any such view as tenable, even if we took it as read, there'd be still nothing morally unique or special or first time uh, in any of the versions, the three versions of the Old Testament Decalogue. Or perhaps there would be. Perhaps there might be. The Tenth Commandment prohibits all manner of covetousness and envy. And it repeats the usual lumping in of a neighbor's women folk with his beasts of burden. <laughs> you can't covet your neighbor's ass, you can't covet your neighbor's wife or his, or his ox. Um, repeating earlier, earlier injunctions about the Sabbath, uh, which make uh, cattle and chattel much the same thing, including human chattel. But you note that in the Tenth Commandment, unlike the others, there's no specific action that's being either condemned or recommended, uh, neither enjoined nor exhorted or forbidden or prohibited. Instead, we've got the first recorded instance that I know of, of thought crime. It's not that you're not supposed to do it, it's you're not even supposed to think about it. This is why those of us who maintain a critique of religion make the charge that it is implicitly totalitarian. It can convict you for things that are only in your head, for thoughts that have hardly begun to form. And there's another reason, I think, why this commandment is somewhat sinister. It appears to forbid the poor from resenting the rich, if you want to make a left critique of it, or, if you want to approach matters from a free market point of view, it seems to crush the spirit of emulation and competition that's involved in wishing you had a better life. Um, some Jewish authors have argued that the prohibition only extends to actual neighbors, in the sense of those who dwell in the immediate vicinity. And some have said it, it, only, it only applies to covetousness of that sort. But it would surely be a fairly paltry commandment that excuse this exact same attitude if it was directed at people further away. And only then do you notice, when that thought has occurred to you, in the mind that you have that's always alive with subversive thinking, you suddenly notice that the children of Israel are precisely and all the time being ordered to covet, being enjoined to covet, being told they must envy and hope to annex the lands, the flocks, the herds, and the women of neighboring tribes. They're kept going by greed, by the thought, soon all these people's property will be yours, and that you'll be licensed to take it by force, and kill them and have the land and not the people. This is perhaps why, this ambition, is perhaps why there are no prohibitions against, say, slavery, or rape, or genocide, or child abuse in the Ten Commandments. It's not a matter of leaving these out or applying situational ethics to a time that was not ours. It's not that, I, th I don't think so. Such things have always been known of and usually deplored. It's more, I fear, that such terrible things as rape, enslavement, uh, genocide, and child abuse are just about to be mandatory. They're just about to be forced on people as things that they are not, not, not just must not do, but must do if the conquest is to continue. The remainder of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, of the Pentateuch, in other words, is largely taken up with exact codification of the different kinds of enslavement of Jewish servants and non-Jewish serfs, the conditions of mass murder and despoilment of other neighboring tribes, neighboring tribes. There are also incidental and, so to say, by the way, commandments such as the one to stone to death any child that disrespects its parents, and the prohibition on seething a baby goat in its mother's milk one of those random commandments on which the whole laborious edifice of kosher and kashrut has since been, been raised. So, let's just trace again, to be sure where we are, amid this blizzard of conflicting hysterical orders, the evolutions of the Decalogue. After the commandments specified in Exodus chapter 20 comes Exodus 21, a chapter of so-called judgments, which gives the verdict and sentence in advance for any number of crimes, from smiting to slave rebellion, and from ox goring to witchcraft. And these two have the forces of commandment, and the penalty, in all cases, is death. Moses then returns from his audience with God to discover his people have lapsed into calf worship and other frivolities. As I mentioned earlier, he thereupon smashes the two tablets, which would surely at that time have been the most precious artifact that could possibly have been known to man, as having been conceived and made wholly by God, 
smashes them and summons the Levites of his contingent to inflict exemplary punishment. And I quote now from Exodus 32, verses 27 to 28. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, so this too is a divine commandment, by the way. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and the fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. So that's a, a terrific slaughter under orders. And you note the small inconsistency, which may perhaps I sometimes think betray the prickings of a poor conscience. In the first verse, the order for the indiscriminate slaughter is from God, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. In the second, it's from Moses. The children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. There's a bit of displacement going on here. We don't know. Um, in either case, it orders the killing of brothers, uh, companions, and in that significant term, as we've seen from the Tenth Commandment, neighbors specified. They must die uh, without pity or without discrimination. That's not excessive, perhaps, after the infanticide of the firstborn of Egypt that's already taken place for them to get this far. And it pales beside the anger of Moses in the later book of Numbers, where he speaks to his generals after the battle against the Amalekites and rages at them for sparing so many of the civilians. Now, therefore, he says, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman that has known a man by lying with him. But all those women, children that have not known a man by lying to, with him, keep alive for yourselves. In the Age of Reason, Thomas Paine drew attention to this passage, saying that it constituted, I'm quoting Paine, an order to butcher the boys, to massacre the mothers, and to debauch the daughters. A fairly good summary of what I've just read. And this earned him a hurt and high-minded rejoinder from the Bishop of Clandaff, a blithering Welshman who used to try to debate Paine on these questions. Um, he didn't contest the butchery of the boys or the massacre of the mothers, but he did say very plentifully that it wasn't actually stipulated that the daughters were being kept alive for immoral purposes. In other words, the bishop left open the possibility they were being kept as, I suppose, pets. <laughs> anyway, after the Levite massacre has shown the Jews who's boss, new tablets are inscribed and presented. In Exodus 34, verse 38, these are the, for the first time and the only time, actually, and only in, the, only, in other words, in the second uh, occasion, directly referred to as the Ten Commandments. But they're almost entirely different from the first version. They are preceded by a ban on intermarriage between Jews and Canaanites, Jews and Hittites, Jews and Amorites, Jews and Jebusites, etc., lest mixing of blood should mar the covenant, so there's a, an early racist injunction. Then the tablets repeat the commandments concerning the Sabbath and concerning idol worship, and then everything becomes micromanagement of unleavened bread, first fruits of the harvest, etiquette to conduct around the tabernacle, the observance of Passover, and the aforementioned separation of meat from dairy products in the glatt kosher kitchen. Highly insipid when compared to the uh, 10 or 10, 12 or 13 of 20 or so verses before. But nonetheless, the only ones now remaining to the children of Israel that are written in stone because the tablets are back. A an inconsistency that so far no one's been able to explain. And thus matters persist until the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy where Moses assembles the masses and gives them the first, that's the Exodus 20 version, all over again. That's the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy, five books later on, no, four books later on, all over again. It's very nearly an exact repeat, except this time the Sabbath day is to be kept as holy, not because God made heaven and earth in six days and then rested on the seventh, but because God brought his people out of the land of Egypt. So it's still to be kept holy, but the reason why it's holy is entirely different. And 22 chapters later, as the Jordan River draws nearer and as the book of Deuteronomy draws to its close, there is yet a fourth set of commandments issued by Moses who orders that they too be inscribed on stone. And these take the form of 12 curses. You should look them up. Forcefully intoned by Levite priests. Cursed, for example, is he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way. Cursed is he that lies with any manner of beast. Cursed is he that lieth with his father's wife. That's, by the way, for the intriguingly Oedipal reason that he uncovereth his father's skirt. Um, one is compelled here to re-examine the authorship of Deuteronomy, which tells us that Moses by then had reached the age of 120, adding that his eye was not dimmed nor his natural force 
abated. One begins to doubt it because it seems that like many elderly men, he'd begun to repeat his favorite stories <laughs> to captive audiences who were naturally a touch shy about interrupting him and not always remembering the stories precisely the same way. A bit the same with some of the incantations. So, I don't want to trespass on the time that we shall have to discuss these great questions together, but I'll just try and pull my threads to a uh, conclusion. It, by returning to the questions I asked at the beginning. Did God make man, or did man make God? And does morality come from on high? Or not? To the first question, the study of the so-called Ten Commandments allows us to return a pretty confident reply. The whole story is one of muddle, chaos, inconsistency, revision as one goes along, temper tantrums, lapses into rage, insanity, sadism, vengeance, and general losing of the thread. This would argue either for a very muddled, irrational, forgetful, inconsistent God, or for no God at all. But if we make the assumption that this mass of unresolved contradictions was the outcome of the ignorant struggles of a semi-literate, frightened species of primates, then the mystery clears up all by itself. And thus I think Thomas Paine is vindicated when he writes in The Age of Reason and writes about the Pentateuch that these books are spurious, and that Moses is not the author of them, and still further that they were not written in the time of Moses, not till several hundred years after that they are an attempted history of the life of Moses and of the times in which he is said to have lived and also of the times prior thereto. Written by some very ignorant and stupid pretenders several hundred years after the death of Moses, as men now write histories of things that happened or are supposed to have happened several hundred or several thousand years ago. As to whether we need uh, heaven's permission and revelation to be able to distinguish right from wrong, those who believe that this is so are on uncomfortable or untenable ground, I think, if they take their stand on the Mosaic Decalogue, or rather on the various discrepant versions of the Decalogue. The Decalogue is a record of callousness and greed and cruelty in which one tribe seeks to claim a divine warrant for the crimes against which it fully, for, it's for the crimes which, crimes against humanity which, it fully intends to commit in any case and goes on to commit this time under the leadership of Joshua, with every sign of relish at its own propensity for genocide. So how could this wretched state of affairs be amended? I've been challenged and asked to update and extend uh, the Decalogue. Well, I think we might as well first have a standardized 10, which at present we don't. Out of a possible 10, as people say, a maximum of four have anything to do with morality. And these are all shalt not type commandments, they're prohibitions. <clears throat> if I'm in, permitted my own wish list, and if I'm allowed to update Arthur Hugh Clough and produce the latest Decalogue, I don't think I'll propose a New Testament style update of the sort that orders us to love one another because, uh, call me old fashioned if you will, the idea of mandatory compulsory love has always struck me as a rather sickly one or even a sinister one, especially when it originates as an injunction from a godhead of which, or of whom, you're also supposed to be afraid. To be ordered to love someone, someone of whom you have to be in dread is a form of sadomasochism. It's the, it's the essence of Orwell's big, big brother cult. It's not enough to obey, you have to love the obeisance as well. It's the seedbed of the totalitarian. Love cannot be exacted. But one might argue in searching for a new code that at the very least we might enact some stern prohibitions. <clears throat> it's not just our modern sensibilities, I think, or our consciousness of the fragility of our survival as a species that might incline us now, if we were drawing up a code, to forbid slavery, to condemn genocide, the rape and torture of children, and the despoliation of the natural order of the world. I hope that these might be considered, in Benjamin Franklin's great words, contributed to Thomas Jefferson's great preamble, self-evident. Unfortunately, though, we can't do this by amending this book, because slavery, genocide, and the rape and torture of children are not merely not denounced in the first five books of the Old Testament, they are rather very enthusiastically recommended. So if we search for ways of doing the right thing, we're, we're consulting the wrong book. And we're looking for morality 
in all the wrong places. Perhaps, though, there is still something to be salvaged, and if so, it might be found in the long, vainglorious, menacing throat clearings of the very first commandment. We might give some real thought to the prohibition on the making of idols and of images. We might do well to stop forging manacles with our own minds and setting up impressions and images of ourselves as if they were divine and rarefied and supernatural. We might cease to make whips for our own backs. We might stop making tyrants and despots in our own image. We have rights as well as duties in respect of one another. And as one can intuit from Thomas Paine, in order to safeguard and enjoy the rights of man, we shall require a new age of reason. Thank you. Well, I think, it's, I think it's a very important cultural question. What are we to do with the, uh, the need we have for the numinous and the transcendent uh, when we've got rid of or talked ourselves out of or evolved beyond or educated ourselves beyond um, the superstitious and the supernatural? That we have not left the, the numinous and the transcendent behind when we've done that. Um, the need that people have for music, for love, for poetry, for landscape, and so on, isn't, isn't to be denied. It, it doesn't, the, the religious are not allowed to claim it unless they want to be pantheistic, which, of course, many of them do, uh, or without realizing it. I'll give you my, what is my favorite example. I wrote a book about the Parthenon, a building which I think I couldn't do without, if I'm sure everyone will know what I mean. I could no more do without it than I could um, Hamlet, um, or the uh, Ode to Joy, um, and, which I think of as one of the, the great achievements of civilization, and certainly um, one of the great achievements of, of religion. But I can go to the Parthenon, I was there recently, and appreciate the fantastic symmetry uh, and beauty and grace and openness of it without caring at all for the cult of Pallas Athena or the Eleusinian mysteries, or the Panathenaic procession, or the animal sacrifices, and quite possibly the human sacrifices, that were involved in those ancient Greek uh, cults and religions. And I think the great, in other words, the, the, the great cultural task facing post-religious society is precisely how to assimilate uh, the insights of, of, the, of the religious part of humanity and the achievements of it um, without giving way to superstition or the supernatural or without making for ourselves further temples where further sacrifices of humans will be exacted from us. And I think a good person could give a life to the solution of that conundrum. Everyone has to give some part of their life, I think, to, to, to working out how that's done, how we keep Ely Cathedral, um, how we keep um, uh, religious devotional music and painting and poetry, like John Donne and George Herbert, for example, uh, while appreciating that they were written under illusions that we don't need to share. Well, I'll have to put myself in the um, care and safekeeping of the audience, sir. I mean, if, if it's thought by everyone else that I didn't discuss the text as if it were in context and if it, as if it were of its time and of its society and of its agricultural origins and so forth, if, if everyone else is under the same impression as you are, then I have failed. Um, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. <laughs> Apparently, I don't need one. Um, but if, if, as you say, it is not to be taken literally, but only at best uh, metaphorically, then you've made the main concession yourself. Um, and my argument would then be, well, is there anything of non-primeval uh, um, morality that we, this is the question I asked, that we owe to this, something that without, without this we wouldn't have? And my conclusion is, my argument is, the answer to that is no that there are many evil things recommended by this text that, to which we should close our ears. Uh, there are many excellent things to which we should be called, which are either not mentioned or are denied, negated um, in this text. So it isn't even a good metaphorical beginning. Socrates, another person for whose existence as a real person we don't have any 
conclusive evidence. He's only described in the work of other people. He didn't write anything or say anything himself that we know about or we can prove, but it doesn't matter because he, if, if you're um, an atheist, because it, the, the, no, one is more, no one human being is more divine than any other. But if, the, if what is reported of him is true, Socrates would refer to what he called a daemon, to an inner voice, a, a, a constant companion to his thoughts that would warn him if in an argument he was making an unfair point or stretching the evidence further than it would go or taking advantage of a weak opponent, that it would, it would like a gyroscope, inwardly correct, correct him. He once paused apparently in the middle of an argument for about 20 minutes while he worked out if his daemon was telling him uh, that he'd gone too far or not and, and went on trial for his life, said in his closing speech that he knew one thing, that nothing he'd said at the trial had had met with any inward opposition from his most stern critic. The, uh, the daemon is the best word for it that I think we have. Um, Adam Smith refers to the, sort of the unseen audience, the person who we're always trying to, to impress. In, it's in his theory of moral sentiments. Um, American colloquialism says morality is um, what you do uh, when nobody's looking, um, what you think you can get away with, you know, how you judge yourself when you're not going to be judged by anybody else. We all know what we're talking about, and, and C.S. Lewis makes a huge thing about calling it conscience and saying, therefore, it must come from or be the gift of um, someone else. Well, I don't see why Lewis says that. Isn't it a lot less strenuous to postulate that this is innate to all people who are not psycho or sociopathic, that we want to think well of ourselves, not just be thought well of by other people, and that that's just as strong an incentive for behavior as covetousness, um, lust, uh, the will to power, and other things. And it predates um, all erections of altars, idols, and gods. So the probability is, it seems to me, that religion gets its morality from us, not the other way around. Thank you. And I've, just to see if I can ram that home, just, I formulated it as a challenge. And I've done this now in debates with quite senior rabbis and uh, of various uh, congregations and bishops and so forth. It's this. It's a simple question. I haven't yet had an answer to it, so I'll, I'll put it on the record again. You have to name for me a moral action taken or a moral sentiment uttered by a believer that couldn't be taken or uttered by me as a non-believer. Something that only a, only a believer, a person of faith could do. I couldn't emulate because I don't have any belief in God. Now, so far, no one's been able to, to suggest anything under that heading. But there's a corollary question, much briefer, and uh, where you don't, you don't have to stay for an answer. You have to think of a wicked thing said or an evil thing done by someone only because they thought God was telling them to do it. Now you've already thought of one, haven't you? <laughs> of course you have. And now you've thought of another. And another. <laughs> well, I rest my case. The um, evidence is from recent measurements of opinion are very distrustful of opinion polls uh, as, as a rule, and they tend to ask superficial questions. But the Pew Research Center in the United States has recently done a lot of work on religious allegiance. And what it's found is that the largest growing minority uh, in your southern neighbor is those who check none of the above in the box marked faith. Um, it's double what it was 10 years ago. I would predict it would double again in the next 10 years. Um, it's about um, 13 to 14% now. Uh, these are not atheists, I should say, but they are people who, if you wanted to say what their common and unifying proposition was, would be, it would be this. A, an ethical life can be lived without reference to the supernatural. Simple proposition. Um, and that plus, I think, the desire to defend the Constitution and the idea of a secular republic and the separation of church and state from theocratic bullying both at home uh, and abroad. People have had enough of being menaced and threatened and lectured and, and uh, terrified by those who claim to have God on their side, whether it's obviously the forces of jihad or more insidiously and nearer home, those who want to have stultifying nonsense taught to American school children with taxpayers' money, let alone the idea that equal time should go to stultifying nonsense. In other words, after the um, biology class, we have the, the intelligent design 
moment. Don't call it intelligent design, by the way. You've, you've made a concession if you agree to call it that. Call it creationism. Is what it is. So then we have the astronomy period, and then we'll do the, Mrs. Jenkins will take you for astrology after the break. <laughs> and then tomorrow we'll have your alchemy papers all ready. <laughs> it's enough to make a cat laugh, and people won't have it. Nobody wants to come from a state that gets la laughed at for that kind of stupidity. And no one's going to hold their convention in the capital city of a state that does it. And it's been defeated now in every court and school board in the land. And I, I, I'm proud to say, I think, after battling it for a long time, I've lived to see these people defeated. Not just defeated, but also humiliated, which is very nice. <laughs> I don't think the religious can have it all ways, you see. I mean, if um, intercessory prayer, for example, um, is valid, and if um, God can be called upon to save, well, let's take the most obvious example, the life of a sick child, and the child recovers, then God has just taken on all the risk. If, that's hap if that happens and is attributable to the intercession, then God has just taken on the responsibility for all the children who don't recover. Now, and the religious get very uneasy when you talk to them like this because they both do want to say um, that help is available from on high. But if it's available sometimes, why isn't it available all the time? Why is it so maldistributed? Why is it so random? Why is it so capricious? It only replaces the argument about suffering and evil uh, to where it was in the, in the very first place, which is why the more intelligent religions are very sparing about claiming. Uh, divine intervention, because they don't want to arouse too great a demand for it. <laughs> now, if, I mean, you may be asking the wrong person in the, when I hear a lot of this stuff, it's white noise to me. If I, if, a dear, if someone dear to me had died, well, this has happened to me, as a matter of fact. If someone comes up to me and says, well, at least they're in a better place now, I don't even remember to be insulted, really. Um, but though I could take offense, I think, at such a fatuous thing being said to me uninvited. But what I can't understand is why I can't put myself in the position of someone who would be pleased and comforted to hear that. I just can't. I'm really sorry. Nor can I imagine myself saying it to someone who'd suffered a real loss. I can't, I can't imagine the expression I'd have to put on my face to say such a thing. So, uh, maybe I'm not the ideal person to put this question. Well, Daniel Dennett, who's a, by way of a sort of colleague of mine in this cause, he has written a wonderful book called Breaking the Spell, which I recommend to you. Um, possibly available at fine bookstores everywhere, as mine is, by the way, uh, here. And in it he says that um, belief in belief, as he puts it, may very well have salutary effects or have had them. For example, this is not very controversial, but it's a good example. Um, in the days when there was no germ theory of disease, and when, for example, uh, quite senior divines like Timothy Dwight, the founder of Yale, condemned smallpox vaccination because it was um, an interference with God's design, which presumably it is if he designed the smallpox virus. Uh, <laughs> now that if, you, if you went, if you were an ignorant fool and you went to the witch doctor ceremony to be lectured by another cynical ignorant fool, you still might have a better chance of, of recovery because everybody knows that morale and optimism does play an X-factor role in uh, good health. So th there may well be benefits to, or have been benefits to belief, but I, I think that we, if I can speak so um, uh, conceitedly, Eurocentrically perhaps, but um, have reached the point where that long ago hit diminishing, diminishing returns. That really the, emanci the, the emancipation of the mind um, requires us to put that sort of thing behind us. The reason why uh, there's a gulf fixed between me and a believer, and also why I have difficulty understanding quite why it is that believers do believe it, is this. If it was demonstrated to me that Jesus of Nazareth had never existed, all right, that there was no truth to the story at all, um, my life would go on exactly as it had. And that all the dilemmas that face us would, in my view, be precisely the same as they always are. 
How do we live the good life? What are our responsibilities to one another? How can we improve on this? Um, how can we build the just city? All of these questions would remain as they will for every generation. To the believer, it would have to be a calamity to discover that this person never existed. They would have to say that the, their lives were pointless, were meaningless. Now, what, just think for a second what a confession that constitutes. What an abject confession that is. Well, in that case, I don't care, they'd have to say. Without the, as, as St. Paul says, if there was no resurrection, no bodily resurrection, then we are of all people the most miserable. What is, what is it to believe this kind of thing? If I say to a Muslim, you know that the Prophet Muhammad very probably didn't exist anyway, he certainly didn't take dictation from the Archangel Gabriel, don't be silly. The guy acts as if I've said the most unbelievably horrible thing. As if, as if life would be unlivable um, if what I said was true, or even if, even if I was allowed to say it. What is this? What is this? I ask you. It belongs to the childhood of the race. It belongs to our bawling, spoiled infancy. We have to grow up and get over this. Now, why it is that people believe it, I think I can make a guess. Um, I think people are afraid of dying. And I also think that they can be persuaded that an exception can be made in their own case. Uh, if they make the relevant propitiations and uh, so on. I, I'm not of that view. I'm really not. I mean, just try it. Um, just try standing in the airport or on the street watching, see them come towards you. Ask first which species of primate they'd be. Okay. Is that a chimpanzee there? Is that a silverback gorilla there? Is that an orangutan there? You'll find everyone you know falls into one category or another. It, it passes the time um, <laughs> at airports. And then you say, now look at that one. Now if that one had gone to church every day and gone to confession every week, um, and tithed himself and so on, he'd be absolutely assured of eternal life. He'd have nothing to worry about. See if you can make yourself believe it. Then see if you can make yourself believe it about yourself. Well, uh, obviously people can, and there are obviously people who know how to make a living out of this racket. Um, but that's why when I'm told, well, at least you must respect people of faith, I say, oh, well, actually, I don't. I don't think lying to children for a living is a respectable occupation. Oh, no, I think the, the First Amendment to the Constitution, which I keep mentioning, is, is correctly the First Amendment, um, because it has an establishment clause forbidding uh, the Congress to make any law respecting an establishment or a support of any religion. And it also has a free exercise clause forbidding Congress to make any law abridging the freedom to attend um, any religion, any church or practice any religion. And I think that's, that strikes exactly the right balance. It originates from the time when it was decided to disestablish the Anglican Church because it had been the Church of British Imperialism in, in Virginia. And the motion of Patrick Henry in the Virginia House was, well, no, we shouldn't go on subsidizing the Anglican Church. Instead, we should subsidize all churches. And Jefferson and Madison said, no, here's a revolutionary idea. Let's not subsidize any. People who want a church of their own can go to it, but they'll have to pay for it out of their own subscription. I would vary it only in two ways, and I think I could plead the Constitution in both cases. First, I don't think churches should be exempt from taxation, because that constitutes a subsidy. So tax-exempt churches shouldn't be allowed. Second, I think if... Um, someone's found mutilating the genitals of their children, they should go straight to jail um, and shouldn't be allowed to plead a religious uh, right to do so. The same with honor killing, same with polygamy, same with bride price, same with child marriage, and I think if a Jehovah's Witness or a Christian scientist lets a child uh, uh, die from uh, neglecting to take them to the doctor, the same should, should apply. That should be the last thing they do on the outside. So obviously the common law has to be made to apply. And I think that Congress should hear and the Supreme Court should hear evidence that no American aid money should be allowed to go to Israel that, that is even diverted to the building of Messianic settlements on the West Bank. Because as well as theft, that's the establishment of religion using American taxpayers' money and should be illegal. And if there's going to be equal time for the teaching of religion uh, in schools, then 
every religion, every church that takes a faith-based initiative subsidy or a tax break should be forced to spend half of its time teaching the origin of species. I think that's only fair.